is a beautiful game. These guys don't look much good, you know, I'm sure we could do a lot better. Anyway, stick around for the rest of the show, we've got some good shit for you. Saturday, August the 3rd, 1986, the Empire Supporters Club made a little piece of history with the first ever recorded soccer road trip in the US. 50 die-hard supporters traveled to Foxborough Stadium, Massachusetts, to see the Metro Stars lose in a shootout to the New England Revolution. On Friday, September the 6th, they did it all again, but this time to play their hated local rivals, DC United, down in Washington. A local derby in Major League Soccer means a five-hour coach ride to the game. But how is it different from an away match back home? There's a, there's a definite lot more Budweiser than you normally you know, would get in a Scottish pass out of that position. 782 bottles of beer later, we arrived at the stadium. <laughs> Going into the game, the Metro Stars were on a four-game losing streak and desperately needed a victory to improve their playoff chances. Stars have just taken the lead and uh, as we can see the Metro Stars are a happy bunch now and uh, the DC United fans well they're, they're a sorry lot but uh, there's still plenty of time to go so we don't know what can happen. We have Eddie Pope and El Diablo we have the devil and the Pope on our team we can't lose. Well you're losing now guys what do you think of these guys 50, 50 guys coming down five hour bus trip in the rain I mean, they're all cool. I mean, this kind of... Well, they're dedicated. Uh, that's good. Yeah. And what do you look? Do you like this kind of support? Are you going to do the same thing at Giant Stadium next time? Maybe when in the playoffs? Yeah, of course. Yeah. What else can we do? They came down. we got to answer it back. Do you think you can match up to them? you think you can be as good? No problem. We, can. we, can bring, we like, live in the capital positive. city. What else can we do? Capital. They live in New York. Hey, they live in New York. You know, this is the capital There's of the world. Their, their city is filthy and their people are rude. DC. DC United forever. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What's this guy doing? Is that a stick-on tattoo he's putting on? What the heck? <laughs> oh, what's the bird's name? Talon. Talon. <laughs> the bird's name is... And uh, how does Talon think the game is going so far, bearing in mind you're two goals to nil down? Pretty bad, pretty bad. Did I hear him say he thought both goals were offside? Yes, yes, that's correct. Both goals were indeed offside. And uh, this man is an impartial observer, would that be correct? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and yourself, how do you think the game's going? Uh, well, from what I've seen so far, it's uh, been a pretty poor performance by DC, but... But uh, the, Metro second Stars, second half. the Metro Stars are a very good team, and they're, quite frankly, kicking your butt. Well, we don't know about that. We'll, we'll see second <laughs> half. Uh, myself and Talon here are going to go outside and finish this off. <laughs> Kevin, there's five minutes left in the first half. DC nil, Metro's two. What do you think so far? It's just the result we need right now. I mean, we really need a great result here. We're not fooling around anymore. We need to qualify. 2-0 going into the half, good for us. We're winning 2-0, and all DC fans are a bunch of fucking losers. <laughs> They're not giving us too much trouble, you know, that's a very harsh uh, opinion. No, they're not giving us no trouble because we're Metro supporters, and they know that if they give us trouble, we'll, we'll roll over them like a steamroller, just like our team is doing on the fucking pitch. So do you think it's worth the five-hour bus trip and getting pissed off? Oh, yeah. It's worth a five-hour trip down here and a friggin' five-hour drunken trip back, and then four hours of freaking drinking in the city afterwards where we fucking win! Metro, you bastards! This is the way the number two team looks. The number three team. You guys here it cause trouble. No. no. We just here to watch this game and, look, and see them lose. Yeah. What's the score? 2-1. To who? 
to Metro, but they suck anyway. They suck. They gonna come back. DC gonna win. Ah, uh, we'll see. We'll see. The Metros held on to take the game 2-1, and the supporters cheered them off the field, and the players responded. So what did match winner Miles Joseph think? So you guys pulled it off. You did well tonight. What do you think of the game? Uh, it was a good win for us. It was a little sloppy, but uh, you know anyone's good, especially coming down here in the D.C. and getting a win out of it. It was great for us. What do you think of these supporters? The what? What do you think of these fans? Oh, they got great fans down here. Not as good as the ones up in New York, but... Yeah. What about these guys that travel down to see you? They're great. Great bunch of guys. They're the best right there. We gotta go back up with him. We're gonna have a party. Hope you enjoyed tonight as well. Good. All right. Thanks a lot. George, you got arrested twice in one game. How did you do it? I just throw in the fear. I just feel the fever. Throw in the fear. I'm a Metro fan, and I just, I just throw in the fear. That's it. So the end of a successful road trip. So it's back to New York for some more beers. beautiful game. The new season in England kicked off with the usual managerial games of musical chairs. Most notably, Dutch maestro Ru Gullit took over from Glenn Hoddle at Chelsea, who himself accepted the impossible job of managing England after Terry Venables resigned because of personal commitments. Up in Leeds, manager Howard Wilkinson was forced out after a few indifferent seasons and replaced by ex-Arsenal manager George Graham, who has now come in from the cold after a year in exile following his well-documented departure from the Gunners. Arsenal themselves axed manager Bruce Rioch to make way for the appropriately named Arsene Wagner from Grampus 8 in Japan. Alan Ball resigned from Manchester City after leading them from the Premiership last season into the relative obscurity of Division 1. And ditto for Ray Wilkins at QPR. He has been replaced by Stuart Houston, who was Bruce Rioch's second in command at Arsenal. And if you're not confused already, get this, Houston has chosen his own number two, Bruce Rioch. I don't know. The soap opera style scandals that plagued English football last season have started to bloom already. England and Arsenal captain Tony Adams has fallen off the wagon and proclaimed himself an alcoholic. You may recall Adams served a two month prison sentence for drunk driving a few years back. This time he says that it was that Gareth Southgate penalty miss that sent him scurrying him back to the bottle. His current divorce proceedings are also a factor and his wife is herself undergoing treatment for drug addiction. And speaking of drug addictions, Diego Maradona started his season by checking himself into a private clinic on the shores of Lake Geneva where he underwent treatment for cocaine addiction. Apparently the treatment was successful and now he's considering yet another footballing comeback. It's nice to see that some things never change in football. Wimbledon's self-proclaimed hardest man of football, Vinnie Jones, received his marching orders for the 12th time in his turbulent career. And if ex-England captain Gary Lineker had his way, then Vinnie wouldn't be allowed back at all. Lineker accused Jones of being self-hyped, untalented and bad for the game. Vinnie's reaction was, not surprisingly, come here and say that. He also called Lineker a jellyfish. That's probably something to do with not knowing whether he's male or female, I guess. There's been a huge influx of foreign players into England this summer. Czechoslovakian Karol Podborski checked in for Manchester United from Slavia Prague, while his fellow countryman Patrick Berger is setting Liverpool ablaze. Good. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Gianluca Viali from Juventus and Strasbourg's Frank Leboeuf have beefed up Chelsea's first team, while AC Milan Paulo Futre sees his future with West Ham. Middlesbrough have captured another Brazilian Emerson from Porto, as well as silverhead Italian striker Fabrizio Ravanelli, who has been banging them in for the borough on a regular basis. So regular, in fact, that his habit of pulling his shirt inside out over his head when he scores has gone, has gone and prompted the shirt sponsors to consider placing their logos on the inside of his shirt. This week's news was brought to you by First Touch, America's number one soccer fanzine. Ask your local barman for a copy. Keep watching, it's the Donna Dooney interview coming up.
Giovanni Savarese, the Venezuelan vulture, as he's known in the media, has been a Metro Stars enigma throughout the summer. Savarese scored the Metro Stars' first ever goal against LA in the opening game, and he's been scoring regularly ever since. Who can forget him coming off the bench when we were 3-0 down at home against the Mutiny? He scored a hat-trick in under 10 minutes to tie the game single-handedly. But both Eddie Fermani and subsequently Carlos Queiroz have consistently refused to put Savarese in their starting lineup, preferring to use him sparingly as a late substitute. We talked to an expert soccer commentator who explained why. One of the big controversies with the Metro Stars is Giovanni Savarese. Why does he not start? I have found the one Metro Stars fan who believes, who agrees with Carlos Queiroz that he should not start the game. Tom, why should Savarese, our top goal scorer, not start every game? In my discussions with the people who have talked to Carlos Queiroz, the thing that they said is, hey, Carlos Ke uh, is that Savarese is too predictable uh, when he's uh, the only forward of, of any measure. He's uh, marked completely, and second, that he's not physical enough. He's pushed off the ball. What do, what do you say to the people who say he scores goals? Yeah, he scores goals, but he scores goals when they put him in the second half. When he started matches at the beginning of the year, he didn't score any goals. So you think a second half super sub? Yeah, um, my problem is that they put him with the eight minutes to go. There's nothing you can do with eight minutes to go. When they put him in the second half, I think he's he's magic. Do we need him today? Yeah, we need him today. We're two nil up. Yeah, well, we still need him today. We've got a goal differential that's shite. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. In the locker room, after the match, we tracked down Savarese to get his side of the story. So, uh, Giovanni, you came on as a sub today, but you couldn't score. What do you think? Well, that's, that's an interesting answer. How do you feel about AJ Wood keeping you out of the team? Um, you know, some people say that your form has dipped a little lately. Would you agree with that? Man, this guy is some tough interviewee. <laughs> so there you have it, the definitive word from the man in question. Maybe he should speak up for himself a bit more. Keep watching, it's the geezer with the curly hair coming up. Fans and commentators across the nation agree that the Metro Star Supporters Club are by far the loudest fans in Major League Soccer today. At every game, they've been behind the goal, up to 300 in number, singing, banging and shouting. Yet from the very first match of the season, this group of fans has been harassed by the so-called security at Giant Stadium. Every attempt has been made to kill the atmosphere. Sit down, shut up, seems to be the attitude. We went to the Metro Stars home game against the LA Galaxy to see for ourselves. As you can probably hear in the background here, we've got the Metro Stars supporters club. They seem to be in a, a good voice tonight. I certainly can't hear myself speak. Just actually looking around, we maybe got a 20,000 crowd here, which is not a bad turnout especially considering that uh, Jorge Campos is missing tonight, Andrew Hughes is missing tonight, so uh, maybe all the girls aren't getting someone to lust after that they'd want to. On the field, things were going very well. The Metro Stars took a two-goal lead, both goals scored by Miles Joseph. But in section 101, how is it going? We're having a lousy time here tonight. We've had a lot of trouble throughout the season with the stadium people, and so far, this match, they're not letting our people in here. The club has an agreement with the stadium that allows all of our members to join us here. Throughout the season, the stadium has, has really given us a hard time. They don't let our people in here. Every week, we have a different rule. Every week, there's a new hurdle we have to jump through. Bottom line is, our people can't come in here, and we feel like we've been ripped off. The club has an agreement with the stadium. The stadium people haven't lived up to it, and our people have really been given the shaft this year, and I'd be surprised if a lot of these people come back next year, and I don't blame them. We found a security official guarding the entrance to Section 101, keeping out the would-be troublemakers. What did he have to say? Do you mind if we just ask you a quick couple of questions? I really can't answer them. I mean, these, these guys, They've got some grievances with the way they're treated, um, and they, they, they blame it on Giant Stadium. I mean, are you told to give them a hard time, or do you, do you just see them, you know, misbehaving, breaking all the rules? Is that why they, they get a hard time? Let me see if I can get your supervisor. 
Well, we couldn't find a supervisor, but we did find a security official with a dodgy moustache and a very suspicious haircut. <laughs> They've, they've had a few grievances over the course of the season. They feel they're being unfairly treated. What would you say about that? It's possible. They have a lot of rules here, but they want to stick to them to, I guess, protect the players. You know, they had, they had people throwing stuff on the field, so. So it's, it's, it's management. It's coming from above, and the guys actually down here think they're good. They don't give you a hard time personally, no? No. So it's coming from, like, Giant Stadium management, the sort of directive to clamp down on them. I suppose, yeah. Back on the field, the Metro Stars eventually won 3-1 and so recorded their first ever victory over LA Galaxy. But before we left, we talked to Michael, another loyal Metro Stars fan, for another opinion. What, what do you think of the security guys? Are they, do they give you a hard time back or are they pretty cool about it? Well, they, they just sort of, they're condescending as if soccer doesn't matter near as much to them as like Giants or Jets football. You know, you can tell that they definitely don't care much for soccer. So you think soccer is for sissies? Well, school's in session. It's not about pads, helmets, or how big you are. It's not about timeouts. It's about 90 minutes of pure adrenaline, strength, and skill. But most of all, it's about a way of life. Watch soccer. Oi, that's football, mate. Uh, right, watch football on the beautiful game. It's the world's favorite sport. One of the benefits of a press pass is that it allows you access to that most hallowed sanctum of soccer worship, the player's locker room, to perform that most devoted of rituals, the post-match interview. The day before the Metro Stars Galaxy match, Roberto Donadoni celebrated his 33rd birthday. It was my mission to wish Roberto well. First, some nipples. We just want to get a naked shot of your upper body for all our women fans. <laughs> um, a win today, couldn't keep the clean sheet, but you've still got the best defensive record in the league. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, as a defender, I would feel great about that, you know. I mean, obviously, uh, we, had, we struggled for about four games, you know, four games ago, and, and that's, that's, as a defender, that's not something that I want to have happen. I don't want Tony to say, see any shots. I don't want any goals to go. Do you think if you grow your hair back, we'll start conceding goals again? I certainly hope not. Um, can, we, can we just have a quick shot? Sure, yeah, sure. It's, uh, it's, pretty, hearty, so it's beautiful. It's, uh, it's pretty smooth, and I, you know, I do it the, 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 uh, the night before every game, so you know, I'm having fun with it, and you know, we'll, get, we'll keep doing that through the playoffs. The fans love it, so keep it up. Good, good, thanks. Thanks very much. The defence is actually best defence in the league as well, so they're, they're doing their job. Yeah, as much heat as we've taken in defence, we're still the number one team in defence, so we got to be happy with that. And now, the Donadoni interview. Roberto Felice Compleano. Grazie. Eh, non parliamo italiano. <laughs> Sono felice di aver festeggiato con una vittoria. Grazie. Sono felice di aver festeggiato con una vittoria. Grazie. I understood about as much of Roberto's answer as I did of the Metro Stars game plan. It seemed to work though. You want to run in a big circle round the field. Campos does that, works a treat for him, so you want to do it as well. And quite frankly, you could do with losing some weight. Tab, Tab, you stand here, you're an energetic little kid, so just run round and round and round and round and round the whole game. That will confuse the hell out of the defence, I'll tell you. Roberto, you're a top man, it was your birthday yesterday, I want you to run up here and give a birthday cake to their keeper. That's going to confuse him. And then Tony, run round in a few circles and then come diving through the middle, score a goal. And oh, did I mention, Miles, you've got to score the first two. But at least I was able to help the referee warm down after the match. Nice legs, shame about the face. He didn't seem to appreciate my help though.
over at Randall's Island for the opening day of the 96-97 season for the Cosmopolitan Soccer League. New York's Cosmopolitan Soccer League is the oldest league in New York City. It's a Sunday league made up of three divisions. Standards range from pub team hackers up to a semi-pro level. We followed some of the action from the first month of play. Looking to the first division, if last season's title campaign was a one-horse race dominated by New York Athletic Club, this year's championship battle promises to be a pretty open one. St. Barnabas have gotten off to a whirlwind start while racking in the goals. While St. Barnabas stayed on top, New York Albanians' 3-0 romp over Polonia saw them nudge New York Athletic Club out of second position. Veteran Pat Zantos's late goal against New York Croatia earned the newly promoted Shamrocks their first win in the first division. The Shamrock reserves also played, but in the first round of the High Decker Cup against West Babylon Force. After extra time, it went to a shootout the traditional way. And after a series of dodgy shots, Shamrocks eventually won 4-2. In the second division, Banatol's 7-0 pasting of Ukrainian keeps them top of the league. Manhattan kickers were also big winners in the East, putting six past New York Wanderers without reply. And after a weak start to the season, Promotion side Nags Head United thrashed Crimean Turkish 5-0 at Leif Eriksson Field. The Dents brothers Allen and Martin both scoring twice, while Steve Jones claimed the fifth. Boston with Rovers, meanwhile, were in the Flamhaft Cup away to the West Babylon Force. But unlike the Shamrocks, they couldn't capitalize, losing 3-0. We now look back to the beginning of the season when Barnston with Rovers played Nags Head United. Both teams, based in the East Village, are deadly rivals. First, some predictions. 2-0 yeah, to, to the boys. Our superior skills will come out and stop and win 2-1. I think we're gonna have a lot of nice games, you know? Our chances, well, we've had all the preparation, it's pre-season, we've been training once this season, and uh, we're ready to go, yeah, everyone's fit and ready to go. So what do you reckon about the chances against the uh, Barnsley? Oh, they're mighty Barnsley, if they've been training two months, they should beat us today, but we are on the next head, don't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> well, with the wind, the clouds, I don't know. I'm feeling pretty good. I, I think they're very good. I, I think, think they're very good. The weather, well, the weather's bringing the hippie out in my man here. So. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, we're just going to kick butt, yes. guy. Yes. You know what I'm saying? I think I have a, a certain experience about the, these uh, games. Just check those eggs. <laughs> if I can't play well, at least I look good. There is your kilt, Mom! <laughs> because I've got my underpants on, Steve, and as you know, the Scotsman never wear underpants. As always, the reserves play first. If one has to follow the path of the law sometimes, and then he goes to play. Yeah. 
This was an emotional game for Barnstormworth reserve coach Dave Wichard, who for nine years played with the Nags Head team. And it's a matter of taking your chances. On this field, you can't play football. We played beautiful football last week. So Dave, what's happened? First game of the season, right? Yeah. Reserve team coach for Barnstormworth Rovers. What's your impressions? Uh, it's pretty good for the first game. We're a bit rusty. The field is awful. It's impossible to play good football on a field like this, but they're trying their best. It's just a matter of taking your opportunities when you get them. We missed a sitter in the first half. Oh, God. So Team hopefully we'll get a few more chances this half and bury one of them. But teams evenly matched? Yeah, it's, it's a very even contest, and it's the same for both teams. If you don't stick your chances away, you're not going to win. Rovers started to put some passes together and began to test the United defence. The tension between the clubs was evident. In the final minute, Rovers almost sneaked to three points with a Neil Lacey shot, but the Nags keeper reacted brilliantly to turn it away. Full time, nil nil. One of the spectators at the game was Barnstonworth founder member Sel Ray David, West Ham Dave to his mates. We wondered why he wasn't playing. Well, I know there's been a lot of rumours that some of the bigger teams have come in for us, but I'm here to cross those right now. Unfortunately, had a, a season ending bigger at the end of last season. It's still hanging on, so I figure two more months, I'll work it off and I'll be back in the, back in the thick of things, ready to play, ready good to, to go. Hear, good to hear it, mate. Nah! Nah! <laughs> In the first team game, early pressure caught Rovers cold. Within five minutes, United took the lead as Martin Dench struck home from a narrow angle. Rovers gradually came back into the match, but were still finding it hard to breach the United defence. The second half continued where the first left off, with Barnstonworth running the game without seriously testing the United goalkeeper. Don Trier came on and produced more movement and attack, which finally paid off when the ball broke to Paul Halcom on the edge of the box and he struck it low into the corner. Following this goal, the game entered an ugly phase, with some heavy challenges and outright physical assaults by one or two Nags players. But this Nags player came off worse. Even the fans were out of control. Don Schreier then produced an overhead kick from 10 yards, which looped over the United defence and into the corner of the net. Barnstonworth Rovers 2, Nags Head United 1. I think we're going to triumph in the second division. If that's the best it has to offer. <laughs> well, that wraps things up. And remember, it's no good just watching. You've got to get out there and play.